What happens at Grandma's stays at Grandma's is a model for you and your grandkids. If it's fun, it's fair game. But lately, hip pain has you grimacing more than laughing. And that's a moment you realize life's too short to put off treatment any longer. The Joint and Spine Center is Cincinnati's leading destination for orthopedic care with hundreds of joint replacements each year. So when a moment has the power to change the rest of your life, go to the one place with the power to change it for the better. The Christ Hospital Health Network. This changes everything. The Pound This Podcast is brought to you by the Christ Hospital Health Network. This is the Pound This Podcast, episode 737, Learning to Trust Your Body and Healing Trauma in Your Central Nervous System with Amy Chavez. I want to lose weight, but I don't know how to get started. What should I meal prep every week? How do I get those sweet booty gains? Inspiration for your healthy lifestyle. The Pound This Podcast with Amanda Valentine. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Pound This Podcast. Before I get into this absolutely amazing discussion with Amy Chavez, I'm obsessed with this discussion and it gets a little real towards the end, just letting you know. <laughs> uh, then we, we do some work on me, which was uh, very cool. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about another amazing woman, and that is Sarah from Team Fit With Me, who has been my personal health coach since the end of October in 2020, who has been a part of this podcast since 2018. She's gone through her own health and wellness and weight loss journey, and now she is a coach, and she has a team of coaches with Team Fit With Me. So if you're looking for a great accountability buddy, a health coach, somebody to teach you about macros, nutrition, fitness, mental health, all of those things, even if you have things like PCOS, hormonal dysfunction, gut health conditions, thyroid diseases, Sarah can help you through all of that. You can get some labs done. Um, All of the meal plan options are reviewed by a registered dietitian. Plus, she's got a food relationship coach partner who's been on this podcast. Lots of good stuff. So if you're interested, you can check out in the show notes, teamfitwithme.com slash pound this, where you'll find 10% off month one of all packages, plans, and add-on services. Again, that's teamfitwithme.com slash pound this. Pound this. Thank you so much for listening to the Pound This Podcast. I'm Amanda Valentine. So excited for this conversation today. Even though last week we already had an hour-long conversation, where I'm like, oh, dang it, we should have been recording this. This was such a great conversation with Amy Chavez. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. It's really good to be here with you. Yes, I'm so excited. This is your first podcast, right? This is my first podcast. Oh, big yes. deal. <laughs> so yeah, we met nervous. through... Um, well, first off, I know Rochelle Ferboda, who's been on this podcast multiple times, um, talking about sex and body and all of that fun stuff. And then she recommended Sarah Buffy be a guest on my podcast, who was absolutely amazing. And then after she was on the podcast, she's like, you have to talk to Amy. She's amazing. And I'm like, oh, my God, I love this chain. <laughs> and so this kind of all stemmed from me really getting into for myself, a a point of interest of trauma in the body, of Mm -hmm. how do we like feel safe in our own body, live in our, you know, to feel comfortable in our own body, working through trauma, which we've all had trauma of some sort. And that's kind of like the the basis of this. So knowing that, tell me, um, you know, exactly what, what you do, who you are, all of the fun things. Oh my gosh. So, um, yeah, so it's interesting because the the way I'm used to introducing myself is as a mom. That sort of was my first job and uh, or role, I suppose, um, in adulthood. And in this moment, my children are preparing to uh, move across the country with each other and start their adult lives together. So it's an interesting identity piece for me in this moment to be starting with who am I and what do I do? But motherhood really brought me into healing work. Um, So I'm a birth doula, I'm a childbirth educator, I'm a prenatal yoga teacher. Um, In the healing trauma world, I do work that's called somatic experiencing, um, which is a body-based Um, it's interesting because in the psychology world, it's called body-based psychotherapy and in the body work world, it's more considered like holistic nervous system body work. So it's basically, uh, the world of somatics is, is the medicine of understanding the relationship between all the parts of ourselves, ourselves as physical beings, as mental, emotional, spiritual, understanding the different roles that we play, understanding the impact of the systems and the social identities and all the different 
ways that that impacts our relationships and our connections with other people and our environment and ourselves. So um, yeah, that's pretty much my, my background. So for about 20 years, I've been a um, trauma-informed birth doula doing um, support work with folks, particularly prenatally through the birth process and then transitioning into parenthood. Um, so my, yeah, my, my love of this work really came very authentically just from deepening, wanting to understand what I was seeing um, in the people that I was supporting and also how to work with my own experiences as a young mom, um, well, at different phases of motherhood and throughout that journey. So, um, and then currently I'm in a, a PhD program through Antioch University um, Graduate School of Leadership and Change where I'm really working to sort of transition from the practitioner knowledge of how trauma-informed care and how um, what I call self-regulation in service to co-regulation, how to use one's nervous system in service to impacting the environment, impacting the relational field with other people as a form of leadership. So that's, um, that's the work I'm in right now. So, I, and I know this is, this is a loaded question of like, yeah, like ex explain that to me, I guess, starting with like, what were you seeing in these women um, in the, you know, the birth process and motherhood process in yourself that you're like, what is this? I, I want to unwind this and unpack this and learn more. Like, what was the common theme? Oh, my gosh. Well, that's an excellent question. And there's a few, there's a few themes. So I would say... On the one hand, witnessing this as a support person, um, some of the themes that really drove my curiosity were um, were related to the seeing the impact of what at the time before I began really deepening my research and learning. At the time, it was like, the way I explained it was like the, f the flavor of not good enough. <laughs> now we call it shame. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, thank you, Brene Brown. This was right yeah. around, <laughs> right now when Brene Brown just started putting out her early books and her TED Talks. It was, was right around that time. And it was like, I had learned about shock trauma, which very much about the fight, flight, freeze response and how that can show up um, in a birth process, but the thing that really, um, I guess, blew my mind and drove my passion and curiosity was, what is this thing of not good enough, this fear of not, of like, if somebody really saw the truth of me, like the vulnerability, basically, it was, yeah. it was helping me understand shadow and vulnerability and, um, really a doorway to understand all those things like what what happens to the things that we want to pretend didn't happen or sort of shove away into the dark or uh bypass you know mm -hmm. um and how those things show up and the thing about birth you know is that over and over again my my job my daily <laughs> workplace my my um, place of being in relationship with, with people was in these extremely vulnerable, cracking open, meeting our edges. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I've never been here before kinds of experiences that labor and birth and motherhood can bring for folks. And so it was that pattern that really drove me to want to understand more about what I came to understand as developmental trauma, relational trauma, what is sometimes called complex uh, P CPTSD or complex trauma. Those are all really the same thing, which has to do with um, early childhood development and how the nervous system is laid down in preparation for a relationship with the environment and what to expect and what not to expect and the patterns that we call personality or psychology that develop from that physiology 
that's laid down in that early childhood period. So that was really, um, and then of course the other piece that's so fascinating and impactful about getting to be in that birth and perinatal time period is you're actually witnessing the generational transition. So co-regulation and really like uh, the beginning of the capacity for health begins in the womb and in that early childhood time. So there's a way that I would see how by caring for the mother's nervous system and really focusing on helping the mother uh, increase her capacity to experience a felt sense of safety during and after the birth process, but also just through the transition itself and begin to work with not only the the physical, you know, stress of labor, but also the generational stuff that comes up, our relationship with our own parents, our relationship with our ancestors, with our family, with our, you know, all the things that come up when we become parents. And so, uh, well, to, to hop on that, a point that you made in our conversation last week that I thought was so incredibly interesting that I had never thought before is that having that sense of trauma that you know, your mom is having while you're in the womb, like how that can kind of program your own central nervous system is like, yeah. that's insane to me. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought that up because actually that's, it's brilliant. It's really the core uh, evolutionary strategy that humans have is that um, the baby's nervous system downloads the state of the mom's nervous system. And by state, I mean the fight, flight, freeze, um, the parasympathetic, sympathetic balance. Um, And it's so intelligent so that in an evolutionary uh, way, the baby's nervous system is being primed for the world it's about to enter. So if, you know, if we think about ancestors and being born into, you know, a cliff dwelling or a jungle dwelling or in the desert or somewhere in the wilderness where orienting to danger was a really wise neurobiological adaptation, right? It was smart for, like, that was an intelligent way for the nervous system to develop was to orient to danger, to be looking for what's wrong so that we can really stay safe. But evolutionarily, what's happened is that the world has in some ways become more safe, but but in many ways it's not. <laughs> and and, and the, the really important thing is that the concept of safety is only it really is a subjective experience so it's not a, when we're talking about like a, a pregnant person with a, a baby it's that pregnant person's nervous system that is downloading the information to the baby's nervous system about the the safety in the environment of like so what they're that, about to be brought into to kind of be what they're about to be them. brought into exactly and so that's where you know when we look at generational trauma and like lineage you know of abuse and neglect and things like that so often what we see is generations of unsupported parents so right. uh, from, from bouncing off of that, like not only yeah. that of just even think of like, you know, when you're like in your in utero to, you know, early childhood development, kind of like you brought up earlier, if you are in this unsafe space or you're in a very space that's filled with shame and all of that, like, is there a way to undo that if you spend the whole beginning of your life in that sort of state yeah. where on of stress uh, on your run your whole entire body like how do you undo that as an adult yeah it's so wonderful because as brilliant as our nervous systems are part of that brilliance is the capacity to adapt and 
one of the things that's really helpful to understand is that Actually, I'm going to back up the question a little bit and okay. just name that part of what happens in that baby's nervous system, again, it's really intelligent, is that if the baby's nervous system reaches out to the environment, cries for what it needs, and it doesn't receive it, the environment does not reach back, then the intelligence of the nervous system over time will choose not to sort of waste its energy and it will just go into that collapse state instead of that uh, sympathetic state. It will just go into sort of that parasympathetic collapse or freeze because it does it conserves energy. And the way that that physiology can develop into what we might call personality or psychology is that as the child's nervous system begins, you know, as they get to be like six and um, the development shifts and they're really getting more of like a self-identity, there's a way that what that physiology, the physiology of the unconscious has been really wise to sometimes shut down knowing when I have my own needs. Am I hungry? What do I want? How do I know? Um, if my emotions were not like if I if I got the sense that having big emotions was distressful for my care provider, for my adult, then I might learn that when I start to have the feeling, the felt sense of distress in myself, that my job was to shut it down, not to ask for support, because that is how I would learn to manage it. So it's a really interesting thing because you know, we do co-regulate. And if we are co-regulating with an adult that is not, does not feel safe and does not um, provide that sense of comfort, the nervous system of the child will still learn to self-regulate, but it will do so out of that survival mode. So self-regulation will feel more like override. Yeah. Dampening, like. And so then when we look into things like disordered eating, in adulthood or even adolescence, you know, that's one of the places that we can see sometimes the behavior as the sort of symptom that's telling us what's happening in the unconscious, in that core part of the nervous system, because truly it, the behaviors become really brilliant, uh, ways to try to adapt, to try to cope and adapt with the adaptations in the nervous system based on what's happened in the environment. Does that make sense? Definitely. So I didn't get to answer. So then the second piece of that is, yes, we have resiliency. We have the capacity to heal. That's the thing that's amazing about the more we're learning about the nervous system as we're understanding how trauma works in the nervous system, we understand also how healing and resiliency happen in the nervous system as well. And the key is consciousness. So it's the understanding that a lot of the things we've been problematizing are actually really intelligent information that our body, our nervous system has been trying to tell us we just didn't understand the language. So when we, under, we shift our framework and we shift our the way we look and listen to our body from a very problematic lens, which would be very much like the medical model, diagnostic, um, mechanical model that looks at the body as like parts that it can fix. Mm -hmm. You know, this is more of like looking at the, the system and how the systems are in relationship with each other and in relationship with the environment. And so... Um, there's something called neuroplasticity in the world of neuroscience and healing. And that is really the concept that we can create new neural pathways. So when I'm sure with your work, you've talked to folks and researched about like changing habits and 21 days and how do we do that? That's neuroplasticity. It's that we use, once we understand, like we, that's front brain. Now we understand what's happening we understand 
when I get this urge to binge or to starve myself or to turn on my computer and numb out or to drink or to, you know, whatever the behavior is, once we know it, once we begin to get the feeling of what happens just before, and then we name it, oh, that's that, that's that feeling, we begin to shift, we begin to change. And the thing that's so beautiful about it is that when we were six months old or two years old or four years old or 11, what uh, like going frozen, going invisible, not having needs or like not eating or binge eating or like however, whatever we did to survive was brilliant. And it was the best adaptation that we had at the time. And when we recognize that, we can heal the shame that's often coupled with the original hurt. And once we work through that, we usually get to have some rage and anger, like where the hell were my adults? Why did this happen to me? And then once we get through that, there's usually some grief. Oh, that was so sad. I was so sad and I didn't even get to feel it. And then when we move through that, usually that's where we get to find what we might call calm or peace or acceptance or forgiveness or a greater understanding, you know, but it's a process. And it's not a thought, it's like, we have to feel it, you got to feel it to heal it, yeah. you know, <laughs> to be the bumper sticker, you got to feel it to heal it. And so the thing that's so beautiful about it is it's almost like reparenting yourself with your consciousness, with your, you know, every, so, so now every time I notice that feeling that would have triggered that self-harming behavior Instead, I can, I can be the most conscious adult knowing part of myself, call that part forward, hold that little part of myself. So in psychology, we do a lot of like inner child work. It's just another way of like, to me, that's a way of like working with the unconscious nervous system. So there's different ways of talking about it and different ways to approach it. But it's kind of that same idea of bringing what happened in the past into the present moment where you are so that you can know and accept and move forward, like really let old things go and move forward and move into the future in a clear way. Because really what trauma is, is the inability to be present because of like the nervous system orienting to what happened in the past and therefore preparing for a predictable future based on that. Yeah. So we break that by being present. Well, what's so hard is spoken from somebody who has lived through this and currently still living through this with, you know, a specific example is with binge eating with me mm -hmm. of having very traumatic events happen to me um, when I was a kid and that was, I mean, there's a lot <laughs> in adult life, too. But like having the, those things of, you know, going into binges to the, eating to the point of pain and, and all of that, where I, you, I also you want to disassociate with even that and looking at that and finding where you're saying, like, stop and feel those feelings. I wanted nothing to do with that. And to me, I, the, the story I wrote in my head was just, well, you just don't have any control. Like you just don't have any willpower. You just love food too much, you know, with this specific example. And it's, I mean, it took me until I was in my thirties to be like this, I, I'm, I'm trying to fix this and I don't know what this is. And I didn't even know that was a label to even put on it. But I think that so many of us try to, not only are we disassociating, by doing those acts that are that are harmful to us, but we disassociating with even when to looking at what any of that is of like, I know if I dug to the root problem and I figured that out, the solution and peace is on the other side, but I don't want to look at that either. Like I would rather just go through this and I'd rather like live in the comfortable pain I'm used to than to pay attention and look at it because I don't want to look at the ugly parts of me because I'm ashamed. Yeah, that's so brilliant, isn't it? 
<laughs> it's hard. Is what it's it is. So <laughs> so I want to say. Yeah. So Brilliant's rough. a way nicer way to put that. That's the positive spin where I'm like, this sucks. Right, let me tell you why. Let me share with you why. Let me reflect why I see you as brilliant. And there's a couple things I'm going to just slow down that you said, which is um, about dissociating, dissociating when I'm doing the binge eating and dissociating when I think about it. And I think you even said choose to dissociate. Yeah. And that's a place I'm going to slow way down okay. and say, I would be curious, but pretty confident that likely your what you're calling dissociate or choose to dissociate or choose like as I dissociate while I'm doing it, my guess is that your nervous system is actually in a place of collapse and what we call global high, which which is a term that comes from the somatic experiencing lineage, which is the physiology of being. So that collapse, that freeze response, it's supposed to be short term, mm -hmm. like real short term. So that like if we're going to get eaten by a tiger, we don't suffer in those few minutes. So when we're chronically in that collapse, it takes so much sympathetic charge to override that just to do what we need to do to function in the world. So that global high is that sense of one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. So my sense, my guess mm -hmm. is that you were operating already in that state and that Part of what might happen before the binge is what you're calling willpower is actually like the adrenaline and cortisol and sympathetic system that was already been at 95 or 100 percent just to keep you going just could not do the next yeah. rise because it was already at capacity just to try to keep a sense of baseline. So dissociating is not a choice. It's never a choice. Choice happens from, the, I'm doing this because oh, we're audio only, but yeah. I don't know if you talked with Sarah about the hindbrain. So, so that part won't make sense. Uh, <laughs> let me slow that down. But so you're opening and closing your hand. Yes, I'm doing the, the hand brain model. So for those listening, you can YouTube hand brain model. Um, but basically what I'm saying is that choice, higher learning, preference. These are all front brain uh, activities. And when we are in distress, the front brain goes offline and we are really being driven by the unconscious survival brain. Mm -hmm. And so when I say it's brilliant, physiologically, the way that I hear what you just said is that place where I'm going to guess, because, because in our conversation before you shared that there was, uh, that there was stress in childhood. Yeah. So I'm going to just go ahead and guess that your system was already in a place of sort of global high and that when more, when a stressful event took place and there was nothing to do, like no more charge that you could, your nervous system was at so much capacity. The brilliance of eating is that it physiologically forces your nervous system into more of a parasympathetic response. So you already had, you probably were already, um, operating from a place of semi what we call dissociation yeah um not really connected but able to really think your way through and plan your way through and you know uh, adrenaline your way through <laughs> and things like that if that makes sense mm -hmm. and like as I'm saying this because we're recording there's this part of me that wants to say like I'm not a diagnostician I'm not trying to tell you what happened to you this is more just me explaining when we talk about framework that's the physiology that I hear inside of that so when I say brilliant 
It's like, look at how that nervous system, look at how your young self learned a way to cope with the pain. Yeah. That was there. Well, I feel like I've, I've traded that in my, and in, uh, over, and I, I still do. So I feel like, you know, binge eating was a big problem for me for a while. And then for a while over exercising was a thing. So it's like, I kind of yes. like wa- walked my way out of that and then went to over exercising. Like, well, I am doing something good for myself and it can kind of go into that disassociating factor of like, oh, I'm just, I can't think about anything else other than this workout where I was injuring myself because I can't feel my own body. Yes. I would go t- tap my brain right out of my body to overwork yeah. out. And then now well, I feel like we're all under a level of trauma being in a global pandemic. So I feel like when things get stressful now, I will go to caffeine and I'm like, okay, I need to bump myself up and give myself a like a yay moment. I need that dopamine hit. So I've gone from binge eating to over exercising to over caffeination now of just, it's like, I like, is there, does that system ever stop of just kind of trading one way yes. to cope to another? Yes. That's such a good question because And again, I just really want to start by slowing down and honoring your awareness. That's the process. Nobody could tell you, hey, don't go from binge eating to over-exercising to caffeine. And you'd be like, okay, it's not (laughs) that. It's like, but the thing is because you be you are practicing some new awareness in this last, has it been a decade? Is that what you said? Yes. Like, yeah. yes. And so the more we practice our awareness, the more awareness we have on board and the more like our perception just keeps shifting. And so the just even recognizing those are all adrenaline. Great. What a wonderful, like, okay, so these are ways that you get that adrenaline boost that you get that sympathetic so how do we how would we change i would say the first thing is always with always with what's here now like so before you go your start your workout the practice, it's not something that you can like know and then like have a concept of and then then you've arrived and you're never going to do this again. It's like what you're learning is the more presence that you have, the more awareness of what's really going on and then the more choices you might have. Like if you're able to slow it down and realize what you're feeling it might mean sitting in 10 minutes of meditation, not checking out meditation, but like body centered, what's happening. 10 minutes of curiosity, what do I notice in my body? You might shift your rituals and routine around your workout to be like, do some real body awareness practice where you're consciously uh, turning on and those sensory neurons and connecting the the body and the brain and this is where are my feet where are my calves where are my knees where are my thighs the quads the hamstrings like really like talk and walk yourself through it's like we're consciously connecting sensory and motor neurons, conscious and unconscious nervous system. And the more we do that in practice over and over and over, that's how it becomes more automatic and creates new patterns. So you might, if you're, let's say your over-exercise of choice was to get on the treadmill and just like run your ass off for 30 minutes, you might decide that you're only going to run for five minutes at a time if that's how long you can stay present. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you'll get down and do some wall push-ups or some like yoga stretches that help keep you in your body and then get back on the treadmill and do 10 minutes if you can stay present that long. But like let maybe that becomes part of your own exploration. How long can I what does it feel like to move and stay in practice with presence? at the same time. Where are my feet? Where are my, yeah. Yeah. That's something I've been working on. I mean, I'm definitely 
I, I'm learning. I'm in the process. So it's, yeah. it's slow, which I feel like everything that I, at least I've learned anytime I've done something quickly, it just slides right out of your fingers. It, ultimately anyway, yeah. if you know, Jeez. knowing that I do that and trying to like, especially like my lower body, like my brain yeah. just doesn't want to connect to my lower body of yeah. finding some ways. Like when I, I try to work on my glutes, like tapping, like just tapping them yeah. until I can feel them. And even just with the workout I did yesterday, of taking a moment once I notice kind of like meditation when my brain starts drifting off and I start thinking of to-do lists when I'm in the middle of an exercise of stopping myself kind of coming back and be like no we're gonna we're I'm only doing eight reps of this I can focus on this for these 30 seconds and trying to pull myself in where I have spent but it's so hard when you spend a lifetime with trying to disconnect those things I'm like I didn't want my brain attached to my body I wanted them to be two separate things and so it's like yeah of trying to knit those together and trying to make that a comfortable safe space and feel that in my own body is I mean that's it's just challenging well and it's where I mean so that's really the work when I talk about somatic experiencing like that's a modality you know you may want to um, explore but because you have so much good awareness of all the things that are happening and where they're from and all which let me just say you don't have to know where they're from like you don't have to make connections with the story to what's happening in your body in order for the somatic work to heal because um, that's the nature of it, it of that work is that it works with the unconscious it works below the memory system and so it's not about opening up painful stories and going in and seeing that's not at all what it's about it's the opposite um and so you know you exploring like an actual modality that that is really specifically about how to do that work in a very titrated supported slow way may be useful emdr is another modality that some people um appreciate um what's that but emdr it's a whole that's a whole different okay thing. <laughs> yeah. and it's not my field of expertise okay. so i can't really speak much to it but it's another therapeutic that works with the unconscious as far as working with the part of the brain for trauma healing well i feel like too with trauma i think that a lot of people um including people that I'm close to are like, well, I never had a traumatic event. It's not like I was held at gunpoint or my parents abused me or anything like that. So they're, they're associating with this trauma, like some big grand event Mm -hmm. where I I don't feel like trauma can be defined. I mean, trauma could be anything. And especially now I'm like, I don't, I don't know how any of us could not have a level of trauma every single day, trying to figure out how to live through a global pandemic. So then how do you, chill through the through those sorts of things if you're you know you're not associating trauma with these big traumatic events you're just kind of dealing with like everyday life and how are we figuring this out like how do you train your central nervous system Mm -hmm. to be like hey we're okay in this very confusing scary Mm -hmm. um unknown future sort of time yeah that's a really good question uh because so first of all just to be very very clear trauma is never an event Trauma is not an event. Trauma is not an event that happened. Trauma is not an event. Okay. <laughs> I said it four times. <laughs> <in the spring. laughs> Trauma is the word that we use to describe the dysregulation that happens in a nervous system that does not process a challenging event. Okay. So it's really useful that, I mean, I did that's, it's like before we even enter into the conversation about trauma, I think that is, it's just a linguistic thing, but again, like all of a sudden there is a lot of conversation about trauma. And I do think people do have a lot of misunderstanding about what it is and what it isn't and how that word is used. And so when we, um, when I think one of the things that's really useful actually is to also just like differentiate that there's different kinds of trauma. So the big event kind of thing, war, gunshots, being sexually abused, raped, like car accident, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The things that people tend to think of as trauma, we would call that shock trauma. 
where the nervous system perceives that something happens too much, too soon, too fast. And it wants to, you know, push away or escape to survive and it can't. And so all that energy that was produced during the event that did not get discharged once we survived whatever it was, because we did not, the nervous system didn't get to discharge and shake and come back to a place of safety, relative safety, which mm-hmm. is part of answering your second question, the next part of that question. We have to have enough relative safety on board to feel like we can discharge and come back to that more parasympathetic, peaceful, rest and digest kind of place. So I'm just going to say, like, capitalism is very traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> our, our culture, this culture, this country, this world at this time, I'm going to say pre-COVID, but absolutely right now. Like, are you kidding me? All the ways, every day, new information, fear, division, um, so many ways that people are being inundated with over information and not having ways to process it. And therefore the nervous systems a lot are walking around with that kind of unresolved energy that we were talking about. And so the, what do we do in my opinion, always comes back to practices of slowing things down and then actually, um, I, I actually have, I'll share this with you here. This might be useful. I actually share a four part model that I find really useful that sort of answers this question. Okay. And uh, the four parts are uh, L-O-V-E. So it's the love model. And it's really a four part practice of what do we do when I notice that I'm in an overwhelm, in a trigger, when I notice that I'm dissociated or I notice that I want to run away or I notice that I want to kick somebody's ass. <laughs> <You> know, what, <laughs> what do I do in those moments? And so the the first thing, so it's really like slow love because we all, we all like that, right? A little slow love. <laughs> the first thing is you slow things down, just slow down for just a moment, which is another way of saying come present. Right. Mm -hmm. The L is an invitation to look and listen and locate your body in space and time. What's happening right now? Look and listen externally. Is there a tiger in the room? Look and listen internally. Do I feel like there's a tiger in the room? What in my body lets me know? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we're locating the physical body. The second step then is the O, and that's to observe the story in the mind and particularly observing the story about my own experience and the other. So notice if the if there's a story, if that if that uh, inner critic, if that inner monologue has a story about myself in relationship to whatever is happening in that moment, whether the other is my environment or whether my other is the other person in the room. So observe what the story is about myself and my environment. That's the O. Become curious. What What am I telling myself in this moment? What's here? Yeah. And then the V my favorite part, and it is to venerate and voice the vulnerability. And what that means is that once I get a sense of what's happening in my body, locate my body in physical space and time, observe with curiosity, what's my story? What am I telling myself? The next part, the V, is that Usually whatever is most vulnerable is what we're going to run away from. It's what we're going to like binge eat over or numb out from or do anything we can to not feel it. We want to escape the vulnerability. But what we know 
is that that's the gold of like helping us understand the wisdom of the nervous system. What's at risk? There's some kind of risk that the nervous system is responding to. So instead of running away from what's vulnerable, the word venerate actually means to hold as sacred, to hold as sacred. So I asked myself, what's vulnerable? What's at risk? Why am I having this reaction? What's at risk? And when that will help us understand what's happening, like what's at risk usually has something to do with a lot of fear of a loss of safety or connection, safety or belonging. All trauma has its roots in safety and belonging. So when we get curious about that vulnerability and we give it voice, now it's in our conscious brain. It's no longer just unconscious because we've named it. I'm afraid that they're gonna think I'm not good enough and I'm gonna get fired. And so that's why I'm acting this way or whatever. Yes. So that's the V. And then the E is bringing in our own loving compassion because we don't want to go searching for our vulnerability all raw and alone. So the E is to engage our resource, engage our resource, which means what is going to help me to feel safe enough to feel that vulnerability that which I would usually want to run away from, what resource can I engage to stay, to stay present with what's happening? So that's the E. And then we kind of come back to the love. So what's here now? Locate my body in present time. Okay, well, my heart's racing a little less. My breath is a little deeper now that I, you know, like, so that helps us walk through the physiology. What is the story in my mind? Well, okay, I understand they're not really out to get me now. You know, like we kind of talk ourselves through, okay, well, what's my vulnerability? Okay, well, I feel a little less risk. I have a little more. Okay, back to the E, what what do I need to feel safe? What resources do I need to engage uh, to be able to feel safe? And that's sort of that four-step process. And that's what I teach in my classes and training. So if that's interesting, you know. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> well, and then it's, it's, it's came back to like exactly where we started this conversation, what it feels like, um, I would say, especially for women, where so much of this stems from, I'm not worthy. I'm not yeah. good enough. Yeah. And it's like, dang, like, why do so many of us feel that? Like, why... Is that so present in all of us? And it, it, so many things draw right back to that point. I'm going to say that the why has a whole lot to do with that developmental trauma of what happens in that nervous system state of um, going into collapse in the, or in the early childhood. Um, because sort of the, the psychology that goes with that physiology is both I'm not good enough and I'm too much. I have too many needs. I'm too big. I'm too loud. I'm too emotional. I have to pee too often. I'm too, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the messages that we receive, yeah. you know, um, I'm too big. I'm too small. I'm too this. I'm too, th- I'm not enough this. I'm not enough that. And it's, that's what we, that was that was really the connection when when I learned about shame, when Brene Brown really came out with her work about shame and vulnerability, that's why I was able to make the connection of like, that's why it's as much of a physiological impact in a birth as like a shock trauma, like somebody that had... Um, had sexual abuse or been in a car accident or sort of had that physical shock trauma, I couldn't understand what this was that I was seeing that this feeling of not good enough would cause a whole system freeze like I was seeing. Do you know what I mean? Like cause that whole response. And that was what the rabbit hole that led me down to understand like, because we are biologically wired for connection. Because instead of being born with fangs and claws, to keep us safe. We're born with parents mm. who are supposed to keep us safe. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, it's, it's so interesting because it's like, God, I'm just talking about describing my life of feeling like I'm too much and I, I'm not worthy. Uh, it's, uh, the worthy thing is a very hot topic in yeah. therapy for me. And actually just a meeting I had this morning before we record this podcast was with somebody that's like, your word for 2022 needs to be worthy, that you're worthy of things. And yeah. I, it's like, I can intellectualize that. I can yeah. intellectualize and understand, well, I, I am worthy. Yeah. I, you know, I know I'm not too much. And if I am too much for somebody, they're not my people sort of thing. And I, I can, I can talk my, use my brain, my, my way through this. But ultimately, I'm making my decision from this very, like, emotional state that it's hard for me to work myself out of that place of not good enough, not worthy, you're too much. And it's like, dang, it is some work. Uh, (laughs) So what I have to ask as you say that is, like, when you said, I know I'm worthy, and if people don't respect my worthiness, then they're not my people kind of thing. You yeah. Said. Well, I, when I know uh, too much, too much yeah. is different than worthy. Don't take it back yet. Don't take it back. <laughs> see? I'm like, I'm, see, I told you I'm a pain in the ass. <laughs> no, 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 no. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Okay, yeah. And just for those that are listening, I want to say that we can see each other on screen. Yeah. Because from that matters, like, because I see you and I see you seeing me. Yeah. And we both understand this worthiness piece. Yes. And you just fell into that. You just had that feeling of vulnerability that came over. Did I say something wrong? Was that too much? That feeling of like, <gasps> And so like, yes, like, I just want to slow us down and really invite you to see me seeing you Mm -hmm. and vice versa. And, and just to notice with that, with this place of connection, like feeling me seeing you, I want to invite you to, again, just slow down and say, I know now how, did you say you're 30? Do you want to say? I'm 39. Nine. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. So <laughs> as you touch into that 39 year old self that said, I know that I'm worthy. And if people don't see my worthiness, they're not my people. Mm-hmm. And as you see me and hear me reflecting it back to you, I just want to invite you. I just want to get curious of like, what do you notice in your body? Um. Well, one, uh, it's interesting. One of like, like tightness in my stomach, almost like, oh, I don't know if we should be talking about me. Um, and two, it kind of makes me want to cry. <laughs> yes, yes. And I want to honor both of those things. Yeah. And I want to just slow down and ask, does it feel okay that we are talking about you? No, it's, no, it's totally okay. It's, it's okay. just such an interesting thing because, and as you saw there, learning about yeah. myself, which is listeners yeah. are learning about too. I, then when I have those moments of we're talking about, which, I mean, I talk about me all the time. Uh, it, it's just, it's a weird workaround where it's like when there's certain points, I guess when it hits like a little tipping point or a little into that vulnerability, uh, uncomfortable mm-hmm. waters ish, I, I jump right into jokes. So then it's yeah. like, Look I know how, how well you know yourself yeah. Look at that awareness. <laughs> So knowing that, I'm going to just invite, if it feels available, I'm just curious, like the energy that you noticed is tension in your stomach. Mm -hmm. If it had a direction, just to let yourself be curious, if it had a direction, which way would it go? Oh. Yeah, not from here, like not like you know, but I guess, I guess, I guess up. Does that make sense? You ask your stomach and see what happens. Yeah, it feels like, I don't know, kind of like up through my body. Yeah, great. Let your body know you got that. Like, let, let you talk, tell your stomach, I got that. See okay. what happens next. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> See, you're making me feel myself. <laughs> and you, it's your show. You can tell me to stop right no, now. No, you're fine. No, you're good. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. This is just such a weird place. So uh, I, I guess my reaction to you saying that too of, of saying, you know, you, I'm worthy and the people that don't see that are not my people. There's part of me that feels like, well, that's not true. That's just something I'm saying that I'm trying to believe. Yeah. I'm just going to clarify. You said that. I just re- repeated yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> I said the too much part. <laughs> so that's where I feel like, well, I guess,
guess it's, it's one and the same, though. So I'm working on the worthy piece of like saying too much is something I'm working on too because I feel like I can, I feel like I can't. To me personally, can come off as too much, too obnoxious of like, uh, 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 I guess like coming uh, yeah i guess that maybe that's just something that's been told to me and that, that uh-huh. I'm, I'm, I'm being i'm believing that i'm i'm too much so i feel like if i'm too much for you you think like amanda's too loud amanda's too pushy amanda has too many dick yes. jokes like whatever it is is like okay well i know they're not they're not my people then so that's a piece that i'm working on but the worthiness i guess it is tied to that but the worthiness is like i don't know of just still feeling like I don't know. This is a hard thing. This is something that I, I, I'm, I'm working through of like, I, of, I guess saying then, yeah, I don't try and attach worry because that was, that was my thought with that, which I do believe of like, okay, if you think that I, I'm too much and you're just like, uh, Amanda's just, she wants to arm wrestle me and tell dick jokes while she's drunk and I just don't want to deal with her. Then I'm like, okay, then we're, we're, yeah, then we're, and we're that's clear. then that's fine. Then that's cool. Yeah. We're different people. I'm I'm a, I'm at peace with that. But I guess the worthiness is is like a, a piece that I, I'm struggling with the worthiness of, um, even with this podcast or promoting it and telling people to listen. If it's just kind of like this is me, this is my personal thing, and can you listen to this or can you give me money? Like I'm really struggling with the part of being an entrepreneur and a business owner of like asking people for money because I feel like I'm not worthy of people spending money on of like, Oh, who am I to tell you anything? And I'm not an expert in those things. And I'm like, Oh, and it just makes, mm-hmm. it makes me feel really sick to my stomach of feeling like I, I'm not in a place that is worthy enough for, for you to be here. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That's just a really struggle point. And it makes me, it does make me feel just like sick to my stomach of if I have to go into a place of like, Hey guys, I would love if you could give a donation so I could continue to have these conversations so I can continue to do this feels like it almost goes into a level where I feel like a, a narcissistic of oh. like, oh, I must be so full of myself, of who am I? Um, I'm nothing special. Well, why, why should you dedicate? And it's, it's weird because it's a lot of the monetary thing is, is tied into that where yeah. I, I love that people spend their time, especially if there's this far into listening to this episode that t- I know how valuable time is to me. And so yeah. it's like to give that much time to someone you obviously find worth and value in. And I yeah. appreciate that so much. So it's like, but I don't know why I'm still telling me myself this story that I'm not worthy when I am at least worthy to some, well, I'm worthy to you enough to have this conversation with me. Yeah. It's this weird, tr- like where I'm, again, I'm kind of outside of myself trying to like yeah. figure out how it's playing out versus my feelings where my feelings is like, yuck, you suck. And trying to get myself out of that place and more into a place of like, this is a story you keep telling yourself that's no longer serving you. And it's keeping you stuck in a place that's not helping you or anyone around you. When you say that, what happens to your stomach? It feels freer. How do you notice that? Can you let it feel freer? Can you help, like, give that a moment? Yeah. Um, oh, it just <laughs> exhaled. Yeah. Yeah, it just does. It, it, I mean, it feels better to talk it through for me. So one of the things I just want to reflect back, again, about the framework, like how I just heard what you just described mm-hmm. is... When you said uh, having to go ask for money, having to go basically convince somebody that this my my work is worthy, my story is worthy, my medicine is worthy, my my gifts are worthy, my purpose is worthy, my show is worthy. Yeah, that it makes me sick to my stomach. And again, what I want to invite is I wouldn't be so surprised if your stomach was already sick. Bef- like not stomach was sick. That's not even like. The feeling that you describe when you, and maybe you even could feel it as I said those things back, is like that's that young nervous system. Mm -hmm. That's that like child having to ask for something from the environment for sustainment, for survival, for thriving, you know? And am I worthy? Am I good enough? Is the thoughts that actually match the physiological state of, can I ask for what I want? Will my needs be met? And 
So part of what I'm hearing you say, like just another framework is like your 39 year old conscious self that is, has been learning and growing and, um, taking chances and taking risks and doing new things has this concept of wanting to behave as if I know my practice is worthy and, you know, and that growth, that consciousness, that adult self, that front brain idea absolutely triggers what inside in some like shadow work, we call it the risk manager that like psychologically, but the part of you that has developed to manage risk to keep you safe. So in a neurobiological way, when you say my, I'm sick to my stomach, I just imagine like, is that making sense? How like, and so again, when we think of it that way, it helps, it helps unproblematize the feeling like we're crazy (laughs) that, that I wanted, I want to grow and be creative, but I can't because I'm scared or I'm unworthy. That is the definition of developmental trauma. When we hear the voices, not good enough, and too much at the same time, you know that's what we're in physiologically. That's it, that's how it shows up. And so one of the things that can be a useful practice when you are thinking about, and let me be like really clear, I just got a full lecture from my best friend last night on the same topic about not feeling worthy and why can't I feel like a badass and why can't I know how why can't I take a compliment so it's reciprocal like it's a that's why this work is such a healing journey and why it's so helpful for women to have peer support for everybody to have peer support but especially I think I'm going to go ahead and say that for women to have peer support and to be able to do this work in um, containers of healthy relationship because Because we would never say to each other the things that we say to ourselves. Right. And so there's a way that like over time, I, I facilitated women's red tent, co-facilitated women's red tent gatherings monthly for 10 years. So it was a lot of women and a lot of stories. And the thing was, part of the medicine of that was like, it made me confront myself and my beliefs about myself in certain ways because I could see the reflection of like the hypocrisy of how much I was in joy and forgiveness and aliveness around other people's stories and judgment and shame and never good enough around my own self. Yeah. And there's a way that once again, once something's conscious, then you have to really be with it. I mean, yeah, it's right? a name and it's real and you can see it and you can work with it and you can have more choice around it. Yeah. Well, and it's, yeah. it's, that's where I think too, of, you know, just in like the scenario you just described, it's like, you can see all those very positive things in other people, which is important. I think to have those people and the correct people in your circle of uh, the sure. people that see those, you know, beautiful things within you that can bring that out of you because yeah. you can't see it yourself because you're in your own crap. And but to to be fair, there's plenty of people that want to tear you down too. And so then it's trying to figure out where that's a whole nother topic of figuring those out my people. Right? Yeah. Of like, so <laughs> you don't know that right away. Like you could think that they're yeah. those people and then you realize yeah. that they're just projecting some of that hurt onto you and yes. then have to work through that own process. So I, I think it's just like, you know, it's I think at least I'm learning the more that I know about myself, a thing that I'm working on of, of being strong within myself and have like my feet planted firmly in the ground and believing in who I am and in my purpose and the things that I want, that it makes me stronger because those people exist and Absolutely. those people aren't, they're going to be around forever, but to be strong enough to kind of that point where I said of like, well, if I am too much, I'm not your people to recognize those things faster and to yeah. also be able to just stand my ground and still be able to be like, hey, I'm here to support you if you need it. But I, I can't accept, you know, you kind of uh, putting that hurt onto me. There, there yeah. has to be some boundaries here. But mm-hmm. then it's like I can I'm getting better at doing that with other people. But then having those boundaries within myself is like that's the, the super hard challenge of 
but it's like, well, I have to live with me forever. I need to figure these things out. But it's like, yeah, it's just uh, it's why it's so helpful to have those good people to remind you yeah. of the good things about yourself. So you don't stay in that, I think, shame spiral, kind of like Brene Brown says, of just constantly yeah. in that loop of I suck. I'm not worthy. I'm, yeah. I'm too much. And kind of, you know, have somebody to help you pull out of it because I know I'm so grateful for people that do that for me because otherwise I probably would just stay stuck. And I have stayed stuck before without yeah. even, even knowing somebody, just even podcasts and books and, and those mm -hmm. sorts of things to kind of almost feel like, you know, I don't know Brene Brown, but her words mm -hmm. mean something to me and can pull me out of those spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's something so important about solidarity in the human experience. Yeah, because we can, part of what we feel in that shame spiral is isolation. I'm the only one. Yeah. So then when we start to realize like, nope, I've, I've walked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women now and the too much and not enough is like, a, it's, what is it? It's like a battle cry. It's like, it's, it's a symptom of, of really cultural generational so do you have hope then with, with you know, the, the work that you've been doing and that you've seen by teaching women this and walking through this, especially when they become mothers, that they can pass that on to their kids? Oh, do you yeah. have like the hope for that, you know, this generation and the better generations before us are really kind of stuck in this loop, but take it to the future generations that we can kind of massage this Absolutely. out of us? Absolutely. I mean, that's to me, that's what it's all about is is under, learning these learning these things so that we can break the patterns and evolve outside of all the suffering, you know, that, that we're in right now because of, um, all the disconnection and trauma. Yeah. Um, so I definitely am hopeful and I definitely love sharing this work with, with, with women that are parenting, but also folks that are supporting other people. I mean, I just think, we all need it, you know, it, it's, uh, I haven't yet met anybody that doesn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so with that being said, thank you for making a beautiful segue for me here. Do you yeah. offer one-on-one -on -one work? Like how could somebody, if they're really connecting with this and, and your work, like how can they take part of that? So I do some right now because of COVID. Um, I no longer have an office at the moment. So I do some virtual sessions um, that um, I have a website. Uh, that, so that's the best way to connect with me. Um, and that's lovesomatics.org, correct? Yeah, sorry. Okay. You say that again. Sorry. Lovesomatics.org. <laughs> Yeah. I'll put yeah, it in the so show notes. Um, I'll promote you. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the thing I've really been developing, particularly since COVID, is more group work. And so I do some virtual women's circles. I do some um, organizational trainings, like how to bring trauma-informed care into organizations, how to look at racialized trauma and... Uh, how that impacts organizations from a trauma-informed lens. Um, and then um, as I, I'll do a little plug for, for Tribe. So we are, I'm just about to um, be launching uh, a cooperative with a group of other women that's called uh, Trauma and Resiliency Informed Birth Education. We are parenting support and perinatal uh, support cooperative and um, it's basically a group of a network of birth care providers, parenting support professionals, um, folks working in the field to um, bring more awareness and training about trauma in birth, particularly, um, well, in I think you're in Cincinnati, I'm in the Dayton area, but black women in our community are four times more likely to die or have a baby die than white women in our community right here in 2021. Wow. So this is a major, major issue. So um, anyway, look for us coming up in 20. We should be born in January of 2022. So there'll be more coming. Will that be virtually or is that going to be in person near Dayton? Um, we are growing. We're starting with a virtual training. And then in the summer, we'll be doing some in-person trainings. 
and then um, as a it's we're we're doing the trainings and then we're developing a shared services cooperative, which will be a way for trauma informed perinatal providers to offer wraparound care. So like your massage therapist, your prenatal yoga teacher, your doula, your postpartum support person might all work together uh, in a trauma informed way. So sort of create uh, more more systems of care for folks. That's so. amazing. Yeah. That's like doing such great work. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, I've well, been so lucky. Well, I, I appreciate this conversation so much. I feel like we could talk forever and I just, yeah. and especially since you're so close, we'll definitely have to like get together yeah. and, and do something or, or record again or um, definitely continue the conversation. I just think that, I mean, I just love everything you have to say, your work and your energy. I just, I just, I just love you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Valentine love. How yes. amazing. Right? <laughs> oh, it's so reciprocal. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Amanda Valentine bites.com.